morning, everyone. Welcome to Platwoods Church. My name is Evie Martin. I'm the lead pastor here. It is so good to be gathered in this space together with you this morning and also with those of you joining us online. From the Gospel of Luke. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit, nor does a bad tree produce good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. People don't gather figs from thorny plants, nor do they pick grapes from prickly bushes. A good person produces good from the good treasury of the inner self, while an evil person produces evil from the evil treasury of the inner self. The inner self overflows with words that are spoken. Why, Jesus says, do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I'll show what it's like when someone comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging deep and laying the foundation on bedrock. When the flood came, the rising water smashed against that house, but the water couldn't shake the house because it was well built. But those who don't put into practice what they hear are like a person who built a house without a foundation. The flood water smashed against it and it collapsed instantly. It was completely destroyed. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. If you've ever been to a souvenir shop at some touristy destination, Niagara Falls, the Space Needle, the Grand Canyon, Union Station, you've seen the displays of personalized memorabilia Keychains, necklaces, mugs, magnets with your very own name printed or etched from Adam to Zoe. You probably couldn't resist spinning the display, looking for your name every time, even if you didn't make the purchase. I, too, searched for my name every time. Longing for some memento that affirmed my existence. But as you might guess, no souvenir rocks or barrettes were ever found with the name Evie spelled Y-V-I. You have to go custom for weirdness like that. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> so while there are no personalized souvenirs in my life story, and my weird name is memorable to some, completely forgettable and confusing to others, how does the Y make the E sound? I don't get it. It is, at the end of the day, my name. It's who I am. It's how I know myself and how others know me. This same thing is true for everyone who has a name. Our names matter. Our names tell us who we are and they tell others who we are. If you've ever changed your name, you probably know this more consciously than the rest of us. Whether you changed your name in a marriage or divorce, whether you changed it to reflect your gender identity, whether you changed it when you moved to a new place because you wanted to be known differently. Our names are a reflection of ourselves. Who we are called, what we are called, matters a great deal. We've had a lot of names coming at us in recent months, all of them wanting to be known by us, chosen by us, recognized by us, many of them claiming to be the solution for us, the protector of us, even our savior, but none of them are. For us as people of faith, there is one name, that is the most important name to us. The one we look to for wisdom, for guidance, for solutions, for life. It is the name above all other names, Jesus. But as Pastor Matt kicked us off last week, he began with the reality that we sometimes forget that Jesus is the name above all names. Matt's metaphor of the junk drawer was really helpful. We all have junk drawers in our homes. Some of us have junk closets. And often that's the place that starts out as where we want to keep really important things so we know right where to find them. But over time, junk accumulates and pushes the important stuff to the back of the drawer where we can't even see it anymore. In a clouded and ever more chaotic world, it's a reality for many of us that Jesus gets a little crumpled up and pushed to the back of our faith junk drawers. His name becomes one among many, not name above all. 
So our series this month aims to center us, to ground us once again in the name of Jesus, the names of Jesus in the Gospels, how he is addressed, how he is known by those around him and known to us now. Matt began last week with the name Christ. Christ meaning the anointed one, the one set apart by God to show us exactly who God is and how God loves. Christ is the one we are to look to in order to see God. And today we'll move to the name Lord. Jesus is Lord. This simple statement is one that rolls easily off the tongues of Christians of all flavors for many centuries. We've sung it together. We recite it in our creeds. Most in this room, if someone just asked you out of nowhere, who is Lord? You would answer, Jesus. If for no other reason, then it's not a title we use for anyone else these days. Our primary association of the word Lord is Jesus. But that has not always been the case for Christians. Jesus as Lord is three things. It is a personal, a political, and a theological statement. I'm gonna try to demonstrate all three of those things today. This name Lord, as Jesus was frequently called by his closest devout disciples, by his most fanatic fans, by his newest followers, is rendered in Greek kurios. At its simplest, the word kurios could be used as we would say, sir, a formal address. But more often and accurately, it was used as an address for a person who had decision-making power over you, a master, a lord. We see both of these elements at work, particularly when Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well. He is a stranger to her, and at the same time, he is a man, and he is a Jew. He societally holds certain levels of power over her for those two reasons alone. She calls him Lord. Kurios. In the first century occupied region of Palestine, many people, especially those who found Jesus so compelling, were bound and subservient to owners. The word Lord is most properly defined as a person exercising absolute ownership rights. In this biblical context, your Lord is the one who owns you. Language of ownership is troublesome to us, as it should be, given our American history of enslavement of African peoples. And for the people of the first century whose bodies and whose work were not their own, naming Jesus as their Lord was an act of personal defiance by which they could claim that he, in fact, did own their hearts. In a world in which they had no choices, Jesus as Lord was one they could make. So Jesus as Lord was a personal proclamation of liberation. At a time when many of the first followers were not free, naming Jesus as the owner of their lives made them free. It would be his claim on their hearts that would determine how they would live. If we zoom out to the wider culture of the early Christians, particularly after Jesus' death and resurrection, we see the Apostle Paul and other New Testament writers leaning into Jesus is Lord as a proclamation. Jesus is no longer physically present to be directly addressed as Lord like he was in the Gospels, but this phrase has now become an earliest creed of sorts. Jesus is Lord. That is a complete confession of faith in and of itself. It's also a political statement. Because in these early centuries of the church, there was someone else who laid claim to the title Lord. It was Caesar. Caesar owned everything. It all belonged to him. He was the master of all. Caesar is Lord, Kaiser Curios was the Pledge of Allegiance for the citizens, the slaves, the sojourners in the Roman Empire. It was their political creed. You can hear the risk, then, the subversion in the statement, Jesus Curios, Jesus is Lord. To say Jesus is Lord was to say Caesar is 
not. Whatever man held power over the people, however absolute he believed his power to be, however oppressive and brutal and self-seeking he was, however much fear he instilled in the vulnerable people of the empire, they still had an alternative claim of allegiance. There was still the reality that Caesar was not Lord. Caesar's reach was wide, his oppression extreme, his actions deplorable. But the earliest followers of Jesus recognized that there was another way. There is always another way. Jesus is Lord. Caesar is not, the king is not, the president is not, even when they think they are. Early Christians made the political claim, Jesus is Lord. It was not an alignment with the powers that be, it was a defiance of them, and so some paid for it with their lives. Some pay for it with their lives still today, In our lifetimes, in our country, to say Jesus is Lord has not come with such high stakes. One day, perhaps, it may again. That does not make it untrue. Jesus is Lord is a political statement of allegiance to one who transcends all pursuits of worldly power and authority and instead subverts them with love. One who is over not just my life, but all life. Which of course brings us to the third angle of this claim, Jesus is Lord. It's a statement that is personal, political, and theological. In the Old Testament, there are two Hebrew words that are used most frequently to name God. El or Elohim, which we read in English as the word God in our translations. This word Elohim is neither male nor female. It is actually a plural form. Elohim is they. And Adonai, which becomes the Lord when we see it written in English. But Adonai was not the original word that appeared in those Hebrew texts to indicate the God of Israel. What came first was a cluster of Hebrew consonants that comprised the divine name for God. They weren't supposed to be pronounceable. The divine name was not meant to be spoken aloud. But over time, that quality makes it complicated when you're trying to read texts, especially in an oral tradition. So later scribes replaced the divine name consonants that couldn't be spoken aloud with the word Adonai, a word they were allowed to say and one that had meaning to it master of everything. The long and short of it is that when you're reading your Old Testament and you come to a place where it says the Lord in all capital letters, you know that that is the stand-in word for that original divine name, which was too holy, too profound to be spoken aloud. Hang with me for a moment then. By the transference property then, for those of you mathy types, the Lord equals God, In the New Testament, Jesus equals Lord, therefore, Jesus equals God. (laughs) When people call Jesus Lord, they are making a theological statement. Jesus is God. The disciple Thomas is perhaps the first to make it in such a way. In the days after Jesus is resurrected from the dead and then appears to the disciples, the first time that happens, if you know the story, Thomas missed it. He was gone. We don't know where he was. Shopping, crying. I don't know what he was doing. He doesn't believe that it happened. But then Jesus appears to them again about a week later when Thomas is around. From the Gospel of John chapter 20, after eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. This is Thomas' creed. It is his affirmation of faith. Jesus is Lord, and he finally begins to grasp Jesus is God. What they have experienced in Jesus is a direct experience of the God of the universe, 
the unutterable name of the divine force of love and life that has been in all things, through all things, before time began. To call Jesus Lord was political, personal, and theological. That was true in the first century. It is true now. These lyrics we sing, this claim, this name of Jesus rolls off our tongues with little thought and not much at stake. But the gravity of the name is worth some thought and some intention for us today. Theologically, when we claim that Jesus is Lord, we affirm that he is God. That how he lived and moved among us in the flesh and how he lives and moves in our hearts now is how God lives and moves with us. The way that Jesus saw the world, his vision of the kingdom is God's vision of the kingdom. The way Jesus invites his followers to live, healing the sick, welcoming the stranger, touching the untouchables, loving the enemy, rebuking the self-righteous, loving God and loving neighbor, this is God's way for the world. Nobody else has a better one. Politically, when we claim that Jesus is Lord, we declare that no one else is. We do not look to a party or a leader or a president to have all the answers, to be the savior to the nation or to the world. We are saying no human structure or being can do that. They are not powerful enough to change the world the way God wants to change the world. They will certainly try. They will sell Bibles and drape crosses with flags, and quote scripture to heretically claim that Jesus has shared his lordship with them, that this is how God's power will be shown through human hands. These antics, this audacity, is antithetical to everything Jesus did and said. Jesus rejected worldly power at every offer. From the Gospel of Luke. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus never sought power the way the world constructed it. He flatly rejected it. The Christians today, actively seeking and succeeding at amassing political power within the structures of the world are wildly off course. They have veered far from the heart of God. They have replaced Jesus' lordship with lords of their own making. This is idolatry. It is the worship the devil desired. Jesus rebuked him because Jesus was lord over so much more. He lived as a man in the Roman Empire with zero political power, none. No office, no credentials, very little recognition. He died at the hands of the state, and yet somehow he changed the entire world. Jesus is Lord. His power needs no mortal governments to prop him up, to enact his vision. His way transcends democracy, socialism, communism, fascism, autocracy. Claiming Jesus as Lord in any of those systems means we know the invitation is to follow. The mandate is mercy. The law is love. And that's where we end. Jesus is Lord is a personal statement for us today. We can love many things, many people, many ideals, but our hearts can only belong to one. If we say Jesus is Lord, he is the owner of our hearts. 
And I'll leave it to Jesus himself to tell us exactly what that means. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? I'll show you what it's like when someone comes to me, hears my words, and puts them into practice. It's like a person building a house by digging deep and laying the foundation on bedrock. When the flood came, the rising water smashed against that house, but the water couldn't shake the house because it was well built. But those who don't put into practice what they hear are like a person who built a house without a foundation. The flood water smashed against it and it collapsed instantly. It was completely destroyed. Jesus chastises his listeners here. You call me Lord, Lord. It rolls off the tongue so easily and you don't do a dang thing I say. Let me tell you what it means for me to be your Lord. It means you hear what I say and you do it. What's more, when you do, it's not just for me or for obedience sake or a power play. No, it's to build your own foundation, the life on which you will live. It's to build a community that can withstand the storm because you are built up on what I have shown you to do, how I've shown you to live. To call Jesus Lord is to orient the entire way we live to the way he lives. He doesn't demand it of us. We do not have to follow. But to his point, if we're not going to, we had better not call him Lord. A few weeks ago, I referenced John chapter 13 in a sermon on humility. On Wednesday, Pastor Jess read it again in midweek chapel. I'm coming back to it yet again today. Something tells me this moment in Jesus' story may draw us back time and again in years to come. Jesus is eating his last meal with his disciples. He takes the opportunity to wash their feet, a task that no Lord should ever do. They are appalled at the disorder of things, and he says to them, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher, and you call me Lord, and you speak correctly, for that is what I am. But if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must watch, wash each other's feet. I've given you an example, just as I have done, you also must do. So many times in the Gospels, Jesus defines what it means when we call him Lord. It is not merely a title. It isn't a claim to power. It isn't dominance and political might. It isn't just a lyric in a worship song. It is a call to action. It is a submission to the way of living and loving that he has shown us. Jesus is Lord is the creed that transforms and defines our actions to be acts of service to those in need. Acts of welcome to those who are left out or cut down. Acts of ministering to those who are sick. Acts of humility and honesty with those in our circles. Acts of getting our hands dirty with the daily struggles of the powerless. Because what the Lord has done for us so we also must do. If we are bold enough to say, Jesus is Lord today, then it is Jesus and no one else's claim on our hearts that will determine how we live. If the Lord's is who we are, then this is what we will do. Will you pray with me? Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. It is in the name of Jesus Christ who is our Lord. Amen.